morning. Today is uh, Thursday, September the 16th, and it's uh, it's a rainy, dreary day, but I'm not going to complain. We can certainly use the rain. Coming into this fall season, where it usually rains a little less, so we're blessed to have that. Um, the glass is always half full, right? I uh, just want to continue to pray for those that we've been praying for. Vanessa, I see you're watching this morning, praying for you. Um, praying for Constantine today as he continues his uh, his transfusion treatments and just pray for his uh, his liver, I think is a specific prayer request that had gone out yesterday. Praying for Debbie Davis as she recovers from her knee surgery and pray for Butch as he serves her in that. Continue to pray for Sandy, my wife, as she recovers from COVID. I think she texted me this morning and said she feels a little better. She thinks, she hopes. And so, and also be praying for those that um, that are are planting seeds and cultivating uh, seeds and sharing the gospel with others. I've had a number of good reports from people having the intentionality of sharing their faith or planting a seed and some really neat stories that are coming out of it. And um, again, this series that we're doing on evangelism is... It's not to try to browbeat anybody to evangelize. And we're commanded to share our faith, to share our story. But it said it would be on the forefront of our mind that every day we would wake up realizing that our intention and our purpose for today is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because all else can happen in the world and uh, others can, many can pass, but um, bringing aid and comfort while, while it's, it's, it's a good thing, if they die and they lose their soul, uh, that's a tragedy. Jesus said, what, profit, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? And so um, we want to be mindful of that. There is a fountain. every single day, every single waking hour of the day. And I am so looking forward to be relieved finally on that day from the sinful flesh. Can everybody agree with that? When the ransomed church of God will be saved to sin no more. Their sins by faith 
I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. And shall be till I die. And shall. I don't know about you, but that last phrase, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be until I die. Redeeming love, love that redeems, and that that kind of love is only God's love, that he loved us and sent his son, Jesus, to pay a price we couldn't pay, um, to redeem us, to purchase us back from slavery to sin and to purchase us from the evil one, the devil, uh, who owned us before we were saved. And um, he has redeemed us. And I want to go out strong. <laughs> you know, I want to I go out the last day uh, professing that redeeming love, that that will be my theme until the day I die. This morning, we're picking up in John chapter 6, verse 16 through G verse 24, where it's recorded in John's gospel as well as Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel, of the event where Jesus walks on the water. And we, we pick up different aspects of, of this miracle and this event uh, in, in these three Gospels. John is the briefest explanation of Jesus walking on the water. And this morning, we're going to take some, uh, some information that Mark records for us in his Gospel um, and also that Matthew records for us in his Gospel. Uh, to put it all together and and um, see this miracle. Verse 16, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Now, this is after Jesus had fed the 5,000. Mark and Matthew both tell us in, his, in their Gospels that Jesus sent them on the way. Jesus had, had uh, given direction to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee towards Capernaum or Bethsaida, which is about a four-mile distance from where the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 had taken place. And their accounts tell us that Jesus went up on the mountain to pray. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were there in, in uh, Israel and stood on that mount where Jesus would have gone up uh, to pray. And as you look out across the Sea of Galilee, uh, you, you could take your arms and put them like this, and, and the majority of Jesus' life was spent in a very small area. We think oftentimes that it was a vast area where Jesus conducted his ministry, but we have to remember in those days, uh, transportation was very limited. Most of the transportation they did was on, on foot. And so uh, Jesus had sent the disciples away, and where the Sea of Galilee is positioned is really in a valley, in a, in a crevice where all around it, uh, there are high, high peaks around it. And it's understood that the waters can get very rough on the Sea of Galilee. Um, it really looks like a large lake. Uh, and um, when the winds would blow and come down from the mountains, it would it would hit the water, and oftentimes it, it, it gets so rough that they're actually white caps. And if you can imagine yourself in a small boat, maybe a 30-foot boat or so, being on the Sea of Galilee when the winds come down and the waters begin to churn, it can get quite rough. And so um, verse 17 tells us that they got into a boat and they started across the sea to Capernaum. This would be north end of the Sea of Galilee. And it was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind that was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were not frightened, but he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land 
uh, to which they were gone. Now, Mark expands a little bit more on this as well as Matthew that when um, they the, when the 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 seas had gotten up, they were they were very frightened, and uh, Peter especially was frightened, as is recorded by Mark in his gospel, and. They looked up and they saw Jesus walking on the water. And both Matthew and Mark tell us that um, that they believed or thought that it was a ghost, that it was they didn't recognize him as Jesus, and they they thought it was a goat. Uh, excuse me, a ghost, not a goat, a ghost. And in Matthew's gospel, it tells us that when Peter recognized that it was Jesus. He got out into the lake, and he also began walking on water. And when he looked around, though, and took his eyes off of Jesus, uh, it tells us that he began to sink in to the water. And Jesus reaches down, and he takes Peter up, and he tells Peter, Oh, you of little faith. Matthew also records for us that Um, the reason he pointed this out was that their hearts were still hardened. Even though they had seen the miracle of him multiplying the barley bread and the fish, their hearts were still hardened, um, meaning that they didn't fully believe. Jesus' purpose of uh, feeding the 5,000, multiplying the loaves and the bread, was to demonstrate that, that he was God and he had power over the created order. And here, again, is another instance of that. And the reason for this miracle, the reason for Jesus um, walking on water and calming the sea, saying, quiet to the wind, was to show and to demonstrate again that he is God and he has power over all of creation. And while we know that the earth and all of its atmosphere is um, is subject to sin, the fall, uh, sin affected not only human beings, but sin affected all of the natural order, we realize and recognize that Jesus, God, is still over all of nature and all of creation. The book of Colossians tells us that all things were created by him, that is Jesus, and he holds all things together. And so the point of this miracle is it really shouldn't confound us any that Jesus walked on water. He can defy the laws of physics. And when God performs a miracle, he defies the laws of physics. He created it and he is over it. So it should not surprise us when a miracle happens. And so in this account, uh, there are a lot of people that have, and and good sermons that I've heard that kind of over-spiritualize this account. And yet we can make some application that that we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and not be like Peter and look away and be gripped by fear. And and that is true. We, 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 We must keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so if we take that and apply that in our lives today, whatever storms might be raging in our lives, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and recognize that that Jesus is sovereign, that he's God Almighty, and that there's absolutely nothing that comes into our life or comes along the way in life, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's an economic collapse, whether it's a government in turmoil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. God is still sovereign, and God is on the throne. And we have to place our faith and our trust in him every single day and in every single situation, regardless of what it might be, that God is sovereign. He does not call us or expect us to understand every situation. They're, they're beyond our understanding. They're, they're beyond our capacity, our ability to see. We, can, we cannot see beyond the moment that we're in right now. But God calls us to walk by faith and not by sight. And we all, I included, have those moments of weakness where all of a sudden we see the storm arise and we wonder, good night, what am I going to do? What's going to happen? Listen, 
That's beyond us finding out. That's beyond us knowing. We have to trust God to be God. And that's a reminder to us in this story today that we've got to trust God to be God. He is who he says he is. And we can place all of our trust and all of our hope in him. Uh, the next verse, verse 22, back in John's Gospel, chapter 6. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side, that is the 5,000 plus, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea, saw there had uh, been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his, his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away and they had gone along. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was there no more, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. I love this. They went seeking Jesus. Now, they weren't seeking him, as we're going to see beginning on Monday, for the right reasons. You see, they were seeking him because of the miracle that he had performed. But they weren't seeking him for, for, for what he could really give them for the right reasons. We're going to read on in this chapter that uh, no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. And all that the Father has given to the Son... Jesus, he will not lose. And what he's speaking of are those who God draws, God brings to a point of salvation where they've trusted Christ, that he will not lose any of them. We don't know who God is drawing. We don't know who the Father is drawing. But we do know, based on what Jesus said, is that no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. So let's pray today that God would, would bring us across the paths of individuals that he's drawing. Because remember, his plan of salvation is that we, the church, the body of Christ, be his instruments, his ambassadors, his mouthpiece of the gospel. Pray that God would give you an opportunity today to sow a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. Where we recognize that that seed has been sown, that we are able to cultivate that seed, share with them more of the gospel. And then lastly, as God would grace us to have the opportunity to watch him save somebody. I pray that you'd pray that prayer, that we'd be intentional about sharing the gospel. Listen, the times are perilous, and I don't know when Jesus is coming back. None of us know, but he could come back this very day. It could be tomorrow. It could be 50 years from now. We just don't know. But our business in the, in, the, in the interim, in that medium time until he returns, is to share the gospel so that all that the Father is drawing might hear the gospel and be saved. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you, uh, that, that he would keep you. Uh, June, I saw where you posted, thanks for the reminder, you'll have knee replacement surgery on next Monday. We'll be praying for you. And Tracy, we're continuing to pray for you to recover from COVID as well. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. I look forward to seeing you this weekend. We're going to be talking more about the gospel this weekend. Listen, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will do such a work in our midst that the only thing, the forefront of our mind, will be saturated with the gospel of Jesus. We've got a mission that he's called us to, and we need to be about that mission. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. I look forward to seeing you Sunday, either in person in the worship center at 10 a.m., or if you're online, to join us in that way. Have a great day.